Hello again, I'm Anahita. Welcome back to In The Zone, our podcast series from the Middle East Treaty Organization, MATO, exploring the issues around banning weapons of mass destruction from the region. Yes, it's not just viruses that need to be eradicated. Remember, this goal is possible. It's a matter of political will. I'm Paul, and today with Anahita, we'll be talking with Ambassador Karim Hagag, a career Egyptian diplomat with over 25 years of service who is now a professor of practice at the School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the American University in Cairo. Both in his professional and academic career, he has focused on issues of regional security in the Middle East, arms control and non-proliferation. So thank you so much, um, Ambassador Kareem. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, To get started, for me, I'm really interested to know what first triggered and developed your passion to get involved in this field. Well, well, thank you, Anahita, and thank you, Paul, uh, for allowing me to share my views with you this morning. Um, so s- since I started my career in, in diplomacy, I've been very interested in the issue of regional security in our part of the world, uh, the Middle East. And I quickly realized that that issue is tied up uh, with uh, the challenge of weapons of mass destruction. and. When I started delving deeper into this issue, I realized that that this was really a chronic problem for the Middle East. I mean, our region has unfortunately witnessed uh, a trend of proliferation in every single class of weapons of mass destruction, chemical, biological, and nuclear. Uh, And this was a hard nut to crack. Um, And unfortunately, Um, While there have been several attempts to address this problem, uh, none of them have succeeded. Uh, And uh, this falls within those areas uh, at the intersection between politics, uh, technology, and security. So it's a very complex issue. And uh, that's what really attracted me uh, to uh, spend the better part of my career Uh, in studying this issue, studying the diplomacy around this issue, and try and figure out how the region can chart a path forward uh, to reach a solution. Karim, you're obviously a bit of a masochist and uh, and, and focus on impossible tasks, but but let me me give you another challenge very closely related to what you just talked about, this nexus between security and justice. Because in my trips to Egypt and across the region, what I get a sense of is that there is a slightly different emphasis to that often portrayed in the Western media, uh, which is that uh, that there's a deep sense of injustice around the way in which these weapons are dealt with by the international community. And I wonder if you could just give us a hint around some of those uh, feelings and attitudes within the region that uh, that those that aren't familiar with it might might get glean some insight yes i think you, your uh, observation is is spot on paul um th- there is a sense uh, uh on uh, in the region uh that the international community approaches this issue with a double standard Uh, And specifically, there is one standard that applies to Israel, uh, Israel being the first country that has uh, proliferated beyond uh, the five recognized nuclear weapon states. And there is another standard for everybody else. And that perception has unfortunately been solidified by just the historical record in the region. If you look at how the international community has responded to the challenge of proliferation in countries such as Iraq, uh, Libya, uh, Syria, uh, you find that in all of these instances, uh, the proliferation challenge was addressed either by the use of military force or diplomatic coercion. Whereas uh, the international community, the United States in particular, has given diplomatic cover for Israel's undeclared nuclear program uh, over the past uh, few decades. Uh, So yes, there is a sense of double standards when it comes to this issue. Thank you. And um, what are some of the benefits that you think might arise to the region if there was progress in working towards building a WMD-free zone? 
I think the primary benefit would be to achieve a level of security with a much lesser threshold of armaments uh, in the region. And uh, I, I think if, if the region does progress towards the establishment of a WMD free zone in the region, it will break this cycle of uh, this proliferation trend, which I alluded to uh, in the beginning. Because uh, as I mentioned, th this is a chronic problem. Whenever we think that this issue has been solved, we see that it uh, pops up again uh, in a different form. So uh, yesterday, it may have been uh, Israel, uh, Iraq, Libya, Syria. Today, it's Iran. And so we need to break that cycle. And uh, the zone idea, uh, when it was first proposed by Egypt in the early 1990s, was with this objective uh, in mind, to break the cycle of proliferation and enshrine the region's security in the zone idea. Thanks, Karim. I wonder, I, I'd, I'd like to bring the attention back to this particular issue of Israel and the relationship with Egypt uh, and how nuclear weapons intersperse with the many different other relationships between the two countries. Because Egypt and Israel do have quite positive working relationships in other security arenas. Um, do you think if this issue around nuclear weapons were resolved, would it make a massive difference to the rest of the relationship between uh, Israel and the Arab world? So thank you, Paul. Th this is a good opportunity to, I think, dispel the misperception around Egypt's diplomacy on this issue. Th there is this uh, sense uh, that somehow Egypt's push for a WMD free zone is targeted specifically at Israel. Uh, let me be clear, Egypt does have a, a, a very strong objection to Israel's undeclared nuclear program. Uh, we have called uh, consistently for Israel to join the NPT as a non-nuclear weapon state, but it's not just about Israel. Egypt has the same objection to any uh, uh, illegal possession of nuclear weapons, uh, and uh, has the same concerns with regards to nuclear proliferation on the part of any state, uh, Iran uh, being a case in point. Uh, so it's not so much against Israel. What we feel uh, is necessary is that dealing with Israel's undeclared nuclear program is a necessary condition to establish the zone that would ensure a, a, an equitable security again, with minimal level of armaments for all countries uh, in the region. So it's not against Israel, uh, but we need Israel to engage constructively in an arms control process that would lead to the establishment of the zone in the Middle East. Sometimes, Karim, I get the sense that uh, there is a really strong sense, not just in Egypt, but across the Arab world, that Israel's possession of nuclear weapons is deeply unfair, as we were talking about earlier, um, but that the acquisition of nuclear weapons by Iran is deeply scary because they may use that, uh, that possession to actually uh, reinforce uh, a, a sense of threat to the Arab world. Do you think that there's any justification to distinguishing between those two? Because that, that's sometimes a Western perspective, sometimes an Arab perspective. I wonder if you could clear up some of that um, distinction, if there is any at all. So, yes, Paul, that, that, that's a good question. It's also a complicated one. So uh, on the one hand, I think th this distinction that you alluded to between uh, what might be called uh, responsible nuclear weapon states and somehow irresponsible proliferators, uh, the, the first being Israel, the second being Iran, as, as a very good example, I think is a false distinction. Um, the, 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 the notion that somehow uh, nuclear weapons in the hands of one state can be tolerated uh, and uh, in the hands of another state uh, would constitute a threat uh, I think is misleading and it really thwarts um, the required diplomacy 
that is needed to uh, push the Middle East on, on a viable path towards disarmament. Uh, but then again, there are other considerations, no doubt. I mean, Iran uh, uh, today does pose a serious security concern for countries uh, of the region, the Gulf states in particular, and including Egypt and including uh, Israel. And this is irrespective of uh, its status uh, as a nuclear proliferator and the concerns surrounding its nuclear program. So this is a complex issue. Yes, there are uh, very strong security concerns when it comes to Iran, but that should not confuse the issue of the need for all states uh, in the Middle East to move together uh, towards uh, nuclear disarmament as a stepping stone towards the establishment of the zone. Thank you, Kareem. Um, I'm quite interested to know what your suggestions would be in terms of effectively trying to incentivize some of the states within the region to actually um, of stop developing weapons of mass destruction, whether it be for military or political reasons, and also maybe building on that, why you think it is that people are so cynical about the prospects of being able to achieve this? Yeah, so so the zone idea in and of itself, when it was first established by Egypt, was precisely done to incentivize Israel to engage constructively uh, in this process. Because it, 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 Israel was the sole possessor of an undeclared nuclear program, and it had concerns with respect to the other uh, weapons of mass destruction programs in the Arab world, particularly in Iraq and Syria. And so it, in an attempt to address Israel's concerns, Egypt called for not just the establishment of a nuclear weapons-free zone, but a zone free of all weapons of mass destruction as an incentive for Israel to engage in this process. The, 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 there are other ideas that the region can uh, explore uh, to incentivize all states to engage in this process. There are certainly confidence building measures that can be explored. The very process of negotiating uh, the, the zone through a, an arms control and disarmament process is in and of itself a confidence building measure. And I think if countries engage constructively in that process, I think the benefits of a region free of this threat of weapons of mass destruction uh, should be to the benefit of all states in the region. Uh, yes, cynicism is justified. The, the, the first time this idea was actually mentioned in an international document goes all the way back to uh, 1991 after the Gulf War, uh, when uh, the ceasefire resolution uh, adopted by the Se uh, Security Council 687 uh, mentioned the need to establish a WMD free zone in the Middle East. So this has been decades in the making with very little progress. So cynicism is justified I hope it doesn't rise to the level of, of your allusion to masochism, Paul, uh, but it is a very difficult endeavor. Uh, cynicism is justified, but nonetheless, the urgency of uh, this endeavor uh, is certainly clear. Uh, without uh, moving towards uh, the establishment of the zone in a serious way, the proliferation challenge will remain as a serious threat to the region's security. And that we, we've seen that time and again over the last few decades. Karim, I wonder if we could probe uh, a little further on that, uh, because if we look at uh, the strategy and the tactics of the uh, Egyptian foreign ministry over the last few years, um, it's it, it, it appears from outside to have been attempting a variety of uh, ways to um, to encourage the international community, particularly the United States, to act with more resolve on this issue, with um, at best mixed results, at worst um, no, no success at all. I mean, we had in uh, 2010 the agreement uh, to have a conference to discuss the issue of a zone, and the Americans eventually pulled out in 2012 and 13. And uh, there were some attempts to meet uh, informally for uh, 
for a few meetings in Geneva, but it never got to the formal conference. And, and since then, we've seen zero progress. Uh, walkouts by uh, Egyptian delegates uh, from the NPT meetings uh, and, and a sense of, I, I think, um, to be frank, uh, deep frustration and, uh, and uh, sense of no progress. I, I wonder what your personal sense is about how we might re-energize the optimism and the positivity that, uh, that will be necessary and whether that will be sufficient to encourage the Americans and the Israelis back to the table. I mean, we have a new US president uh, who perhaps uh, holds a bit more uh, uh, positivity towards arm con arms control, but at the same time, you know, uh, the Obama administration um, held out promise and then didn't deliver on this issue. And uh, the, there's there's not a great deal of reason to think that the new administration will be any more uh, committed to uh, to driving Israel to the negotiating table on this issue. Uh, what, what are your thoughts uh, about um, about how we might cooperate uh, with the Biden administration in the interests of uh, the establishment of a process where we can at least light the candle of hope with regards to the zone? Right. So the United States is a key stakeholder uh, in this issue, in the issue of the zone and the issue of WMD disarmament more broadly. And that's really for two reasons. I mean, number one, the United States was a key sponsor of the 1995 resolution in the NPT extension conference that allowed for the indefinite extension of the treaty. So along with Russia and the United Kingdom, the United States was a, a key sponsor uh, of this resolution, and it has therefore certain obligations towards uh, this issue. But, but secondly, the, the United States is the superpower that has uh, historically afforded diplomatic cover for Israel's undeclared nuclear program. It has uh, shielded Israel from uh, diplomatic pressure uh, on this issue and is therefore, unfortunately, somewhat uh, complicit in the maintenance of Israel's status as uh, a country outside of the non-proliferation treaty. So the United States on both counts is, is a key stakeholder that we have to engage with. Now, Paul, you sort of rehashed uh, the history of the various attempts to uh, engage the United States constructively on this issue. And uh, you're right, unfortunately, uh, that they have failed. But, but I think what might be an interesting change on the part of the US approach to this issue is what we see with respect to the diplomacy uh, surrounding uh, the issue of Iran's nuclear program. So the very long and complex process that led to the JCPOA uh, that, that was unfortunately put on hold after the Trump administration withdrew uh, from the treaty, uh, and the Biden administration's attempts to revive uh, the, the, this agreement, um, I, I think have indicated that the United States is trying to grapple seriously uh, with a very hard proliferation problem. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's coming to the realization that it's not just about Iran's uh, nuclear program, but it's about issues that touch on regional security. And so we, we, we have this, uh, um, what could be the, the, the beginnings of a process to engage countries uh, of the region in a regional security process. Uh, in parallel with uh, the diplomatic track to uh, address Iran's nuclear program. And therefore, it, it's grappling with these very complicated issues uh, uh, related to proliferation in, in the region. Now, our hope is that we can appeal to the United States, not on the basis of fairness or altruism, but on the basis of realism and U.S. interests uh, in the region. And we have to, we and others, we, we have to continue to drive the argument that in order to deal with 
the issue of proliferation in the Middle East, we have to deal with it comprehensively. It's not just enough to deal with Iran's nuclear program, because if it's Iran today, it will be somebody else tomorrow. And so we, we have to keep hammering that argument that to deal effectively with this challenge, we have to think of a much more uh, a comprehensive and constructive approach to address the proliferation problem in the region as a whole. And uh, Karim, are you optimistic uh, given where we are in relation to the Abraham Accords, which the Americans recently agreed with a number of Arab states and Israel? Or do you see uh, there to be a, a very clear new direction from the new administration that may abandon that approach and take another one? How do you feel about, uh, about where we sit right now? So in, in the midst of all of these frustrations that uh, I'm sure you, you are well aware of, Paul, um, th there appear to be two issues that, that may constitute a silver lining. Here, uh, the first uh, may be the the Abraham Accords, uh, in, in that Israel has argued for decades that it cannot engage in a constructive disarmament process involving nuclear weapons until the region makes progress in terms of peace between Israel and its neighbors. Well, the Abraham Accords uh, was a very significant step uh, in that direction. Uh, and I think this may or, or this should constitute a catalyst for the international community to challenge Israel on its longstanding position in, in this regard, that there is now significant progress towards peace and mutual recognition in the region. And building on that momentum, uh, that there, there is a potential to engage in a regional uh, arms control process uh, leading to the zone. The, the other silver lining here is the process that was launched uh, under the auspices of the United Nations uh, last year uh, in the form of the conference on the WMD free zone uh, in the Middle East. Um, now, this it was mandated by the United Nations General Assembly uh, held under the auspices of the UN Secretary General, and it constitutes really the first time since the 1995 Review and Extension Conference of the NPT, where we have an international forum uh, that is mandated to reach a legally binding treaty establishing the WMD free zone in the Middle East. Now, as we're all well aware, the United States and Israel have so far taken a position uh, to boycott uh, this process. However, that train is moving and hopefully we can show that constructive dialogue within that UN framework can actually put forward concrete solutions to address the many complex issues involved uh, in the zone and hopefully pave the way for the United States and Israel to join that process in the future. Thank you. Um, that was really interesting, especially as you mentioned near the end about the United Nations. You have a great deal of experience working for both your foreign ministry and within academia. And I'm interested to know what you see the role of civil society as being within all of this. The role of civil society in the region is a crucial one. Um, the issues we face uh, are extremely complex. Uh, again, going back to what we were talking about earlier, I mean, the WMD free zone touches on the issues of security, on the issues of the technical issues with respect to the disarmament of uh, weapons of mass destruction programs, touches on the issues of law, touches on the issue of uh, uh, trust. And these are very complex issues that I think governments uh, are not in a position to address uh, on their own. So the, the support of civil society groups uh, in countries of the region that can open space for a dialogue both within their own countries and uh, between uh, different countries on this issue uh, will, I think, form a, a sort of uh, a support mechanism for mm -hmm. the diplomatic process uh, as it moves forward. 
Great, Karine. Thank you so much for this uh, uh, characteristically clear and concise. And uh, I really enjoyed this interview. Thank you both. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Anahita. Uh, thank you for allowing me the time to share my views on this issue. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you. I've gained a lot from this interview. Um, just to wrap up, I guess thank you so much to all of our listeners for tuning into another episode of In the Zone. Just a quick reminder that you can find us online at www.wmd-free.me, where you can subscribe to our newsletter, donate money, or even volunteer to work with us if you're interested. And we're also on social media. Our Twitter handle is wmdfreeme, as it is on Facebook and Instagram. And there we'll be posting a series of regular updates so you can get involved with our work. And for our podcast, you can find us bi-weekly on SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. Yes, and do get in touch. We'll do our best to answer your questions or ask the next interviewees your questions and maybe they'll give us even better answers. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thank you.